Now, I, I take your point completely, and I think that is that, uh, the culture change that we are talking about. And I can see Puneet Ji agreeing with us. I'm also conscious of time here, that uh, we are almost past our two hour uh, window. I'll take, I'm going to keep another five minutes before we wind this session down, but we might keep alive informally after that. Uh, so, uh, Puneet Ji, what do you think? Is, are you buying into Paswati Ji's comments? Uh, See, she is absolutely right. See, uh, in case what we, but what what I feel is, let's say forty percent of the people are there who still have faith in Ayurveda, or maybe thirty or forty, but we need to catch those sixty percent as well. So it is for both. It is for the total acceptance. What I feel, I may be wrong, but this is the personal perspective. Uh, okay. Like in case, let's say thirty or forty percent people still using Ayurveda and accepting it. But what no. about the next seventy percent? Okay, thank you so much, Sri Rajji. What do you what do you feel is where we are? Hello, Sri Rajji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am here. Uh, I agree uh, with uh, Dr. Paswati Bhattacharya completely. Uh, that is the reason why I, I was emphasizing on crossing the barriers, especially for inflammation. <laughs> I know I've been in US and Europe for many international talks, uh, for especially for the functional food and that supplements. But the reason is that why, even though they don't have the clinical, the, the, according to them, the clinical evidences that they are looking, even though they are trying it and they know the value of this system, because for especially for chronic diseases, that they are getting the benefit. But what I'm saying is, why don't we do this as well to get a global acceptance to the maximum potential? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sri I think you put this very, very correctly, the, the whole thing about uh, upscaling and also um, uh, scaling up. Uh, evidence helps. Uh, and I think there's nobody here... Um, uh, denies that. Uh, I want to quickly bring uh, Kulkarniji into our discussion. Kulkarniji, if you have something, yeah, to just, add. you are hearing different perspectives on this problem. Just, just a very short comment. You no, know? please. I think I have been dealing with the barriers for the last 40, 50 years of my medical practice. I, I found that barriers are more in the mind and scientific ego of a lot of people. It doesn't have to be modern medical, even with Ayurveda and other things, there are a lot of prejudices against each other. And I'm glad to note that those barriers are melting very quickly because of the open, openness of the society. And we don't wait for all the barriers to collapse. You have to start freeing yourself from your own barriers and progress. If you are strong enough and you are sure enough, you start your systems for your own local use rather than waiting for somebody oh, else from across the globe to approve that and then you follow that. No, you don't do that. You are worried about the clinical population, clinical diseases and mass care. I think that is a very important point I would like to make. Thank you. I'm so happy that you have mentioned this, uh, that the barriers can be broken locally. And I think uh, you will add to this when, we join, when you join Baspati Ji on Sunday, the 4th of October. Uh, I hope you can uh, add to this these comments when you are there. So please do note, this is where we will be on uh, the first Sunday of every month, starting next month. So October, November, December, we have three sessions here. And we will look at in greater detail all these issues. Uh, the first is why there is conflict between modern medicine and Ayurveda. And Kujaniji has just said that uh, there, is an, there is a problem there and we will try and address all these. Uh, so thanks to Baswati Ji for keeping the flame alive uh, for the period that she has and to take it on and to expand on it as we go into the next sessions. Now, we are coming rapidly to the close of our event um, for the two hours. So I want to thank Anil Khandelwal Ji who was with us. He had to leave us because he had some uh, emergency at home. Anilji, I don't know if you are still there with us. If you have left, then thank you so much for joining us. 
Number two, uh, Puniji, you have given us a very detailed uh, uh, presentation of your ongoing COVID-19 work. And we hope to see the results up in the clinical trials registry soon. When will your results be? Because I've seen your study design and study trial registered. How long before you can put, the, put your results up? Or is it still a while? Next, next 20, 25 days. Next 20, 25 days you will have, and we will be able to study your trials. Now, could you tell us a little more about how the sponsors are reacting to your study? Okay, okay see, uh, specific to one study, because we started three, but two of them are not working well, so we discontinued them. But the one uh, with a combination therapy, and both are from Ayurveda, is work remarkably well, and one can see a daily decrease in the viral load. And that was the major thing we were working on. And uh, uh, so far, the results are not very much 100% claimed in five days, like most of the companies claim these days. But uh, we can see a very much reduction in the viral load. And uh, uh, in five days, uh, we have got over 80% of the good results. Though everybody was a little maybe uh, from, because, but uh, the sample size is very small so far. So we cannot uh, make a statement here, but uh, yes, very soon the trial would be over. We would be making statements too. Are there any other studies going on where you are, or is this the only one uh, that uh, you're handling? For COVID or for the other ailments? Ayurveda, Ayurveda related trials. Uh, for Ayurveda, actually, we are the all purpose, we are only focusing on Ayurveda and national products. Like, I do have seven clients from Europe from Denmark, from Germany, uh, from Netherlands, and one recent from Switzerland. So, uh, but all of them are from national, uh, national in Greece. Thank you. So what I thought is, because I was working, this is the third generation into Ayurveda from uh, the family perspective. But what I thought is, uh, I should be, if I would be opening a CRO, then definitely I would only work for the natural products. Though I'm doing a trial for a bot, but that is an observational one would be work. It would be helping us to run the natural product trial well. So that was the reason we took that. Otherwise, we're working on the natural ones. Thank you. We might even get you involved with our activities so that we can have a fuller session and fuller sessions on understanding these trials and their intricacies and where we might be able to, to add better value in terms of, you know, shots. Uh, uh, in fact, I would learn too. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Puniji. And uh, uh, I think uh, Gopi uh, Sriraji has left us. So thank you, Sriraji, for joining us. And uh, we still have um, a few more people here with us. But thank you all for joining us. Before I leave, I just want to say thanks to the Ayush Valley team who are hosting these events and holding uh, all this together. If you visit our Ayush Valley webpage, you will see a section highlighting the memberships. And uh, for us, uh, people like yourselves are very, very important to keep this active, vibrant, and to grow this activity with time. So please uh, review our membership details and where you can be, how you can become a part of our uh, Valley-related activities. And uh, our next event will be a national seminar, which will be next week. And we will share details of the events. And uh, uh, please don't forget that on the 4th of October, we have uh, uh, Baswati Ji's uh, Ayush Hard Talk, uh, where she will be addressing many of these difficult questions. Uh, so, uh, Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, before I go, the last word of thanks to our um, uh, sponsors and our uh, partners in this, the Ayurveda and Health Tourism magazine, who have been working on this project for many years, and uh, also uh, several people on our panel uh, who are helping grow the Ayush Valley activity. Thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to having you with us again next week and in programs to follow. Thank you.
But I think you no. should not let everyone oh. leave. You should tell so, them yeah. that there's a... No, people are here. So we still have... Uh, so you Sheffield. should turn off the recording and then you should turn it back okay. on again for the after show. Now, uh, um, Yadu? So Yadu knows how to do that. He can turn Yadu off the recording. Should, Yadu, if you... Uh, we should, if you can take us off Facebook live... Yeah. Leave the Facebook on because we just okay, want the recording. The yeah. yeah. Turn off the recording so that when people get it on YouTube, they'll get a short recording for the show. And then we'll start it again for the after show, which is um, a little of casual talk that's more open. And Madan, can you change it so we can get a gallery view? Because all we can see is a speaker view. Oh, gallery view. Am I controlling this aspect? Uh, well, the whoever's the host, I can't see anything. So I don't know who's got the... I can't see... I can't they've see they've pinned it. Yeah, they've pinned it to speaker view. And they should okay. pin it. Okay. Uh, Yadu? I think Yadu will know. Yadu will know this. Now we have... Uh, uh, Jobin uh, has just left. Aditi, are you there, Aditi? I, Aditi, you're there. Can you, can you see us? Can you unmute Aditi? Aditi, hello. Yes, Aditi, sir. can you, now, can you hear us? Okay. Yes. yes now, Aditi is a BAMS uh, student. Which year are you now, Aditi? Sir, can I'm in right now. Can you turn your camera on so that we can see you? No, because we're all disabled. Oh. Uh, but I like your picture. <laughs> I know, Aditi, I'm hoping. Aditi, can you hear us? Actually, because of uh, this network issues, if I put on my video, then there will be a lot of problems with the audio as well. Audio. So that's why no. I put on the audio. Aditi, can you tell us, t now which year are you? You are in Jaipur studying where, which college are you studying, Ayurveda? So, uh, I'm from Jyoti Vidya Peet, Jaipur, uh, and I'm a final year student of BMS. Final year student of BMS, very good. Have you enjoyed your studies? Uh, sorry, sir, hello? Have you, have you enjoyed your studies in Jaipur? Uh, so, <laughs> can I be frank? Tell, you should be frank, of course, and keep in mind you're on Facebook Live, so the world can hear you. So tell us, oh. be frank. Um, uh, I'll say that there is a great requirement for BMS to uh, have a revolutionary change in its education system mm -hmm. because it's, uh, it's horrible, I'll say. It's actually horrible. They are killing all the students uh, with two, like, two universities like modern medicine and Ayurveda they are cramming mm -hmm. all those up in, in those uh, like five and a half years and after these five and a half years we are like so confused like which system to follow which routes to follow mm -hmm. modern medicine is a wonderful one and it has a very different route and beginning and our ancient sciences Ayush system and all these traditional systems have a very different route of uh, beginning and understanding so to like clubbing them in a single syllabus and making uh, us like cram them in our question paper answer sheets and all those stuff it's like uh, yeah, we, we have baffled it by all these things we are so confused which treatment protocol to be followed whenever a patient comes to the clinic and how to treat that patient and no. mostly the, hello I just say very good. No, I'm just saying, number one, please note that on the 4th of October, all these issues will be addressed by Dr. Baswati here. And Baswati Ji, as you well know, she has done her, she's trained in modern medicine. She has done a PhD in Ayurveda from, BA, uh, from BHU. And she will be addressing all these questions. Uh, I haven't uh, 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 I haven't told Baswati that you have shared some emails with me uh, about the need for a change in how the education system, um, the inadequacies of the education system. I'll, I'll, I will do this 
Can I ask her a question? Please, please, please. Uh, Ari, also, you... Basmati, one second. I also have Dr. Hari here. Uh, Which Dr. Hari? Uh, I can see a Dr. Hari here. I'm asking Hari to unmute. Uh, Dr. Hari, are you here? Yes, Dr. Madan, I'm here. Oh, please tell us a little bit about yourself before Basvati, before I ch take the microphone to Basvati. Yeah, um, Dr. Madan, uh, we met once in uh, Bierstein in 2015, if you 2000, remember. In Germany. Oh, I'm trying to remember your face now. Tell me a little more, where are you located now? Yeah, yeah. I'm located in uh, Tiruvella, which is uh, midway between Trivandrum and Cochin in Kerala. Which, very, yes, I think I now recollect your face. Do tell us a yeah. little more. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 uh, 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 running the NSS Ayurveda hospitals in Kerala. Oh, NSS okay. is a public trust, mm -hmm. so we have four Ayurveda hospitals. I do work as their coordinator, and I'm doing clinical work in two of these hospitals right now. When and uh, I did my masters in medical anthropology in Heidelberg in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes, and now I am a PhD candidate in global health at VU University Amsterdam. Oh, wonderful! Now, where are you today? Where are you talking today from? Kerala or from? I'm in Tiruvella. I'm in Tiruvella. I'm talking from Tiruvella now. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much for staying with us, Dr. Hari. Now, you have met all the people. Uh, you at least been briefly introduced to all the people today, and we are fortunate uh, that you are here with us and you stayed on with us. Uh, the NSS hospitals, how many of them are there in Kerala? Four or more? Four. We have four, four hospitals run directly under the NSS management. And we have an Ayurveda college, which is a, run by a cooperative society with now, directors mostly from the NSS uh, organization. Now, is, is this the first Ayush Valley event you are attending? Because of your this name. is the first Ayush Valley event I'm attending. I'm sorry for that. But I was How? following Dr. Paswati's talk and uh, uh, a few other talks on the, uh, on the YouTube the last days because I have been uh, uh, communicating with Dr. Majid and uh, Mr. Benny uh, okay. regarding for the last uh, uh, week. Yeah. I'm so happy that you are here with us, number one. Well, thank you for staying back because we can, we are, we can now have this chat. And... Uh, uh, very happy to hear how you are. Now, where did you do your BAMS? You studied in Kerala? Trivandrum. I did Trivandrum. my Garment yeah. Ayurveda College. Garment Ayurveda College in Trivandrum. So you are a very enterprising person in that you've studied BAMS, then you went and did your medical anthropology in Germany, and now you're doing your PhD. In... Now, are our discussions, you know, today's theme is a very important theme, that of uh, scaling up Ayurveda. Uh, not only Ayurveda, but Ayush systems in general, you know, the, all the systems we need to scale up because there are huge benefits that people are having. And Dr. Vasvati defended it very correctly by saying people don't care. They have a problem. If it works, they just do it. They don't care for clinical trials, etc. And the second one is upscaling this thing, you know, making it a little more um, acceptable for people who are reluctant to accept this. So we must account for that too. And I think Puneet Mithal presented it nicely saying, okay, maybe 30% will work, go with it. What about the 70%? And there are points of this kind. Now, as an anthropologist, I'm sure you think about these issues, medical anthropologist. Where do you see uh, the difficulties? Do you buy all the arguments that we that we distribute today? And I, uh, you know, I'll let you talk a little bit about this because Basvati Ji also has many ideas and talks on this. Yeah, Dr. Madan, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very interesting, uh, but uh, also a very complex issue. This is uh, what anthropologists and also uh, scientists of medical humanities would call a double bind issue, mm -hmm. a double bind. I hope you understand. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So on one hand, we are arguing the epistemological uh, differences Ayurveda has got with modern science. And we argue that uh, the, the uh, complete acceptance of science in the scientific paradigm is not very important or crucial for Ayurveda, as it is a lived tradition 
and lived embodiment mm -hmm. uh, of uh, people of a subcontinent. And so we don't need, uh, it has been there even before science. So science exactly. has, and so we can argue like that. But at the same time, practically, uh, in terms of industry, in terms of commerce, in terms of, as you said, scaling up or upscaling, whatever, we need the scientific paradigm and we need to accept this also in going forward. So my point as an Ayurvedic practitioner and also having studied medical anthropology and obviously being a practitioner, my heart rests with my science. So for me, I will say we have to keep this double bind also, but at the same time, all these efforts have to progress in all directions. And that is, that is how nature works. You know, it's, nature works not just in one direction, but it works in all directions, as we all know. So we need scientists to progress in their own way. We need anthropologists, philosophers, uh, all from, from different walks of life who are involved in our system to work in their own ways and to be pioneers. And all this will somehow focus towards a better and greater end later. That is my, 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 my take on this. Thank you, Dr. Ari. You know, I think Dr. Baswati is in Udupi right now and there's very heavy rain in Udupi, so her signal gets cut in or cut out. You know? No, I could hear you. Oh, you could hear us. So, uh, Dr. Hari, on the chat, Baswati Ji has shared her email address and right. she has also right. asked a question there, what is your PhD on and what is the field? Uh, I could not hear you. What is your thesis topic? Have you identified yeah, something? Yeah. My, 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 my PhD is on psychiatric pluralism in Kerala. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Baswati Ji, all your So, Aditi, don't go away because we, you, I, I want you to listen to all these things as, we, as we're going through. Uh, well, my, my question was actually for Aditi about 10 minutes ah, ago, okay, please, and please. that was, Aditi, if I put you on a committee of students who were going to determine how the national education policy was going to play out to reform Ayurvedic education, and you had the floor and you could give five concrete suggestions of how BAMS curriculum or training should change? What would be five concrete things that you would suggest knowing that the way that you answer is going to not only affect policy, but the potency of your answer is going to affect whether or not people take you seriously? What would you say are five things? Um, Aditi, you're there. Aditi has sent me an email with this. Some of those things she has elaborated very, very nicely. I'm forwarding this email straight away, uh, Baswati Ji. But Aditi, please continue. Um, and Dr. Hari, don't go away. Please stay with us. because Yes, we'll ask Dr. Hari after this because he also did BAMS. Yes, yes. Aditi, go yes. ahead first and then we'll ask Dr. Hari. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the question. Uh, the First and foremost thing which I like is uh, the way the subjects are divided uh, in the whole four and a half years of our curriculum. Uh, we are copying the uh, medium, modern medicine system uh, wherein we divide it in physiology, uh, anatomy and as such way. But wherein we come to core Ayurveda, Therein, uh, all the acharyas, um, like uh, mostly uh, Ashtanga, emphasizes upon uh, eight branches of Ayurveda, which is the uh, most integrative way of studying those subjects, all those eight subjects. So I'll prefer that our uh, specifically BMS curriculum should include eight branches instead of uh, dividing into uh, Rachana Shari, Kriya Shari, then uh, Kama, Vritya, Prasuti, Tantra, when we have uh, all three eight branches, which are uh, perfect uh, subjects. And if we really want uh, like few people have uh, immense interest in uh, subtopics, so we can uh, go them, make them further uh, units and not completely divide uh, according to the modern medicine system. Uh, like, I think, I, and the second point, uh, I like that we, uh, 
uh, we must be trained in uh, project based uh, um, uh, environment like we must be given more of projects which are activity based and rather than the copying system like uh, which we which we are following since uh, like the current uh, cbse syllabus and other boards which are going on in india wherein uh, we just copy and paste the stuff from the textbooks and in our files and notebooks and all those stuff which is being continued even in the higher education systems uh, like uh, even in the colleges where we are in uh, second year or third year we get many projects and we just cut copy and paste them so why not provide uh, students with project uh, like activity based learning uh, tell them to choose whatever uh, topic they feel like from that particular subject of that year and they must explore it they must go around like to, uh, one new concept which i came across was why not students students are from different areas and india has such a vast culture every locality has its own culture and taste and uh, its own medicine as well so why not students go and explore the, that area and come up with new traditional techniques which are lost to us now and to be frank ayurveda is a book com uh, a compilation of all those traditional techniques itself it's not a, a single uh, thing like one day someone sat in a lab laboratory and came up with all these ideas it's a collection of 1000 years of work so why not initiate that thing in the uh, students as well in today so they will be even more interested in the subject and like uh, the third thing uh, the ongoing uh, virtual platform which is being used here today uh, we must have interactive sessions and Uh, if it is like even in the future, if we we are we discard this virtual platform, uh, which I doubt, but it still we get back to the uh, old classroom system. Still, I prefer that we have debates in our classes instead of making the students uh, like uh, a professor comes into the class and they just begin upon the topic. That is not something uh, I like as a student because. Uh, in the school years primary school secondary school we were being taught now we we need to escalate our education and we need to put up our own thoughts why not teachers describe that uh, this is the topic for tomorrow and we come up with our own researches and our own hunting down about the uh, things which you can search upon the topic and we can discuss upon it and from there we can generate many ideas and we can even get many of the concepts clear and uh, like i can come up only with these points uh, aditi thank, uh, thank, thank you. you i have shared i have shared your entire email thread with basmati ji and uh, we will follow this up very very precious what you have offered us you know so and, and i and i want to add to what madan said aditi um i am in the process of putting together hard talks for the further sessions beyond the ones we've announced and we are looking for bams students who are in their final year or have uh, finished in the past two years who are bams graduates and we want to have them engage in a debate as you have said the idea of learning tarka the idea of being able to go and research your ideas and present some points based on questions that are given to you beforehand and we want that to be a national level debate and what we hope is that everyone that listens to us copies what we do plagiarizes what we do and does it in their own local area whether it's a local debate in a regional language or whether it's a school level debate it's not hard to do certainly there are a few groups that have started doing it but they don't take it forward and so we are going to be having an episode of hard talk where i'm going to ask some of the questions as i asked you and what we ardently hope is that people from the pmo and from the ministry of ayush will be paying attention so that as this nep rolls out some of the ideas ation ie the students will actually have impact rather than armchair uh educationists who you know haven't been in a school seat in 30 years so thank you for your inputs and i uh i hope if you have anything else to say that you 
from you again. What I'd like to do is say, uh, take forward what Madan was saying, which is um, to ask Dr. Hardy, since you also finished uh, BAMS, what would you add to Aditi's list without repeating what she said? What kind of changes would you think would be very important in the education? See, uh, for me, I will say uh, we were focusing mostly on Ashtanga Hridaya from the Ayurvedic part. So I would rather say, uh, I'm not arguing for a text-based uh, study, but uh, text-based studies are also quite important for Ayurveda. So uh, I'm not sure regarding the use of Ashtanga Hridaya in other parts of India as a basic text to learn Ayurveda. But I have found it very useful. Uh, and whenever the graduates come to me for their uh, training, I would suggest them to follow Ashtanga Hridaya because it is like a very, uh, very practical uh, collection of uh, treatment uh, aspects. So they uh, learn more on Ashtanga Hridaya. So I will suggest uh, the use of Ashtanga Hridaya in the clinical uh, periods uh, or inclusion of that also uh, as a text to follow in the clinical years. That is number one. Number two, I would suggest uh, uh, second point, which I would like to mention regarding the improvement of the AMS uh, curriculum will be uh, as, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether she, she identified that, uh, the, the way in which the lectures or the teaching style is going on, that has to uh, improve. And I think she mentioned also in her uh, uh, talk about that, that I will definitely uh, say. Number three, I will say about vernacular textbooks. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Malayalam, we have many vernacular Ayurvedic uh, words, like the Sahasra Yoga, number one, the Chigilsa Manjari, number two, Vaidya Manorama, number three, all these vernacular local language textbooks are very important. And actually learning further the practice of Ayurveda, all the Vaidyas and also even the graduates these days, they have to go through this. So number three will be that. Uh, the, uh, the vernacular textbooks have to be included not just in Kerala, but in every other part of India, they will have vernacular local language textbooks. So there should be a space for those local traditions and knowledge. Number four, I will say uh, apprenticeship. Apprenticeship, as you all know, Guru Shishya Parampara is uh, very important in Ayurveda. So I have been uh, even at work apprenticing with uh, three or four uh, mentors, including Patna Sri, Dr. K. Rajagopalan, uh, Dr. P. Shankaran Nair, who was the founder principal of the Coimbatore Ayurveda College, Dr. Sarojini Amma, who was awarded the best doctor award for lifetime achievement by government of Kerala. I, I have been lucky all these years to be apprenticing with seniors. So even when you are doing your internship, if there is, uh, there is like a mentor to which you can attach you uh, and this mentor can change or something like that, there should be a, a clear cut a way or methodology of apprenticeship, uh, even during the internship or uh, the formative years, that will be benefiting a lot for the Ayurvedic uh, graduates. And finally, uh, the, the communication skills, the presentation skills, etc. cetera, they, they should also be a part of the Ayurvedic curriculum. That also I have been lucky on the, from the internship time onwards, I was invited to give an introduction Ayurveda course for international students at a cultural school near my home in Aranmula village, which was started by a French national. So I have been uh, introducing Ayurveda, giving talks, giving introductory lessons, uh, for almost 20 years now. And so that has been, as Dr. Madan said, that has been quite inspiring me for, for, for all uh, these years. And so I think that is, that is also very in, important for the BAMS curriculum, the communication skill development aspect. Uh, and also I will add on uh, medical humanities, uh, a brief study of medical humanities also, including medical anthropology to be uh, a part of the uh, a BAMS curriculum as well. This is my take on uh, the BAMS syllabus. Thank, Thank you for that.
Thank you. Aditi, did you want to add anything from hearing Dr. Hari's list? There's just one more thing I'll prefer. Like, uh, we have a yearly packet of examination. Uh, I'll prefer that it could be made up to six months of examination. Like, after every six months, we must give an exam. Because what I have seen is, like, for those one year, when we, uh, at the end, we, when we give the exam, we have such a tremendous amount of syllabus and even for it's for for even for the examiner it is very difficult for uh, like judge the uh, or like uh, what i can say right to, uh, it's too much material yeah yes. too it's too much material and we have uh, like even the students get to know this part is much more important and so we must be focusing upon that so the syllabus gets cut short and the evaluation process then uh, for decays down then uh, further. So we must have six months of examination instead of one year of examination, wherein we like jeopardize with the quality of education, like quality of evaluation more importantly. Thank you. Thank you for your inputs. Thank you. Everything. So, you know, I'll go ahead, oh, Madhan. So, no, uh, we have. Uh, Aditi, thank you so much for clarifying. Thank you. You have a lot of insights and you are sharing. Thank you for sharing this. We would like very much to also draw in some of your friends also into these discussions. So Vasudeva will, will, will try and engage with you a little more and uh, bring in more younger people into our discussions. And uh, I, um, I, I will discuss at our board meeting about a student-driven uh, aspect of the value and that's going to be very important for us and that we will see how to shape this. So give me a little time, a few weeks time, and then we'll have a result and we'll discuss among our, uh, in the Irish Valley to see how student involvement, uh, we need greater student involvement in many of our activities. So that is one comment I wanted to make. Dr. Hari, are you able to put your camera on? I'm trying to, I'm now curious, I want to see I want to put a face to the name. Um, if, if you can, I don't know if you're taking this call on a mobile phone or if you can. Yeah, I'm, I'm on a mobile phone, but uh, I can't, uh, I can't find to how to You don't know how to turn the, the camera, camera on. on. Okay. What, no, just, it's that the camera is disabled. There's no switch to turn the camera on for us uh, unless they put us into the group of people who can actually. That is. That's strange. I'll have a chat with uh, um, yeah. as to what is happening. There's a panel group and there's an audience group and you can take members of the audience and put them in the panel like we did last time. And but right they, now, yeah, and then we have a little button next to the mute button that says turn on your audio and we can do that. But right now, the way that it is uh, governed, we don't have that. I have a question for uh, Dr. Hari. You have spent a lot of time in Europe. And I want to touch that one issue that is, overlaps a little bit with the theme of today's event. Um, are you able to practice in Europe, number one, when you are in Europe, number one? Number two, what do you think is the status of um, Ayurveda acceptance in Europe? And keeping in mind that I'm also General Secretary for the European Ayurveda Association, so I have a perspective on this too. Um, where do you feel we could, let me give you, just elaborate a little bit and um, say what is in my mind and how um, Ayurveda could do better for health and the health care of people in Europe, number one. is that we have heterogeneity in health systems across the 28, 27 nations of the European Union, till recently 28, where uh, countries like Germany have an American model insurance driven primarily. And if you don't have insurance, then you know, it's unlikely you will get uh, a certain kind of health uh, care. But, uh, and countries like UK where we don't have health, health insurance except a certain amount is taken away from our salaries into what's called the national insurance. And in turn, we have access to free healthcare. 
So those are the two extremes. And then we have models of the kind in Italy where every region has a system, a certain degree of freedom. And there are a lot of new public-private partnerships, in, particularly in the curative side. And uh, there are big gaps in the health promotion and the disease prevention area. And these are the big gaps. Now, where do you think a better dialogues can happen with uh, individual countries of the European Union and also with the, the players like the insurance companies? Have you ever thought about this or is this something uh, I'm sure you have because you are in that anthropology space and you look at uh, things slightly differently from the ordinary physician? Well, uh, Dr. Madan, uh, the first question, uh, I was able to practice Ayurveda in Europe, even during my student time. Mm -hmm. When I was the student at the Heidelberg, I was a student at the Heidelberg University. I used to commute to Kastrop Rauxel, which is yes. near Dortmund, yeah. uh, every week, like 400 kilometers uh, to practice at the Kerala Ayurveda clinic in Kastrop Rauxel, and then come back for my other days of uh, university lessons. Uh, but uh, the issue is, uh, in Europe, you have a very limited availability of medications. All those which are available are as dietary supplements or body oils or such, uh, situa you know, such uh, propositions and not as approved medicines. And uh, uh, later in my time in Europe, I was working with Professor Shuntek at the Neurology and Complementary Medicine Department at uh, uh, Evangelicious Krankenhaus in Hattingen. Uh, and there, uh, we are not doctors. We are Wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter, which is Scientific Research Associate. There are two Ayurvedic doctors working at the same uh, position in the same uh, hospital. Uh, now, Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Sunil, both of them from Government Diary with the College in Trivandrum, one my senior, one my junior. So there you practice uh, as a scientific co-worker in the neurology, with the neurology team, and you help them get a protocol of existing Ayurveda therapy for Parkinson's. They, they mostly deal with Parkinson's and MS patients. So uh, the status of Ayurveda there itself is clear. Number one, you work either in wellness, then you prescribe, you don't prescribe, but you suggest, uh, you know, supplements, you suggest uh, the body oils, you can also do panchakarma to a certain extent, uh, that is number one option. Second two, number two op option, you work as a scientific associate, but then you don't uh, suggest anything, but you, uh, mediate a protocol which is already existing with the medical team uh, there. So these were the two options. There may be, may be other options also. There are many, many doctors like Dr. Jeevan who teach uh, extensively all across Europe. There are uh, people who are giving workshops on body therapies and all that. So these are the possibilities which I have seen. Uh, and also, of course, you have the academic path as well. You can, you can, you can do... Uh, you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Arjun Apadurai said, we are living in ethnoscapes. So you, you can live your imagined lives. So uh, even the Ayurvedic graduate have the power of imagination and uh, uh, he can or she can also live their imagined life. They can dream of, uh, and I think uh, if work hard, uh, succeed in doing a PhD at Harvard as well, like Dr. Paswati came the other way down to, Varanasi to do her PhD in Varanasi. And I really graduate, I believe, uh, if seriously work on it, can do a PhD in, from Harvard as well. So this is what Dr. Appadurai said, uh, the power of imagined lives. So uh, that is the first part uh, I would like to answer. The second thing uh, regarding insurance and the health systems, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, frequenting Italy, Switzerland, uh, uh, now I have a group from France. I have been giving a few talks in France also 
Germany. I studied two years there. So, uh, as you said, the systems are different in different countries. Uh, the legitimacy of the Ayurvedic practice also is different in different countries. In Germany, Professor Schuntek can run it because uh, there is uh, insurance coverage uh, for what he is prescribing. So I think that could be one uh, prospect for medical integrated uh, medical practices. Uh, there is a possibility in many countries to fund this from the insurance uh, aspect in Germany. Especially. So for other countries, I think it is mostly out of the pocket. And then Switzerland, that's another interesting example. In Switzerland, there is a big uh, interest. And in Switzerland, the practice is mostly out of the pocket expenditure, but they are very interested and they have passed uh, legis uh, legislation, as much as I know in Switzerland, that they need alternative and complementary medicines. And Ayurveda is also on the uh, rise in Switzerland uh, because of these reasons. Um, I'm not sure I did answer completely uh, to your question, but I, if your question is which is good or which is uh, not good, I'm not sure I'm, I'm capable enough to answer that because uh, uh, UK, I don't know much about it, uh, but uh, NHS, no, you, I know that it works. You, yeah. you have touched you have touched on that important thing about legitimacy, and that is uh, important. That is very, very, very important um, that you identified that as an issue. And our discussions today about scaling up, upscaling has all of those aspects as the underlying worry that uh, we want to scale this thing up there is so much resistance to it. Uh, what Dr. Kulkarni uh, said today about the ego issues that are there, even if you have evidence that people don't, or what Dr. Paswati says, you know, there are people in the FDA who would uh, like Ayurvedic treatment. And uh, if they have a health issue, they just want to get it sorted out. They don't care about clinical trials and this and that. And I think that is a those are uh, this is the realities of life. When somebody is in pain, they want to sort the pain out, you know, and they don't care whether it comes from uh, double-blind control studies. If that solves the problem, then that's how it is. And that is one aspect of um, the sociology of where we are today with these things. And hope these kind of discussions, when more people engage with it will give us a new direction and that uh, new confidence in where to go. Now, I have... Uh, um, Baswati, I don't know if you wanted to add there something, but we have Pramish here. Pramish, can you hear us? Pramish? I'll, add, I'll add after Dr. Pramish comes on. Dr. Now Pramish? You, you will remember Pramish as uh, from the Ravis group of hotels. Pravi, uh, Ramesh, hello. Yes, sir, I can hear you. You can hear me. Hello, how are you? You are in I'm Colombia? Absolutely fine, sir. No, no, I am, I am, right now I'm in uh, Trivandrum. Right now I'm Trivandrum. in Trivandrum. Yeah. Okay, which, which property are you in today? Ravis, which one? Kovalam. Sorry? Which, where are you today in Trivandrum? Uh, no, right now I'm in my home. Oh, you're at home. Okay, sorry. I yeah. thought you were, you, were, no, you were in one of the Ravi's, Ravi's properties somewhere. Our Ravi's oh. Kogulam is not yet open so far, our, uh, but our Calicut property is open with a few rooms in different okay. categories. Okay. Planning to restart very soon. Thank you. Ravi's, you know all these people here. Maybe you chatted the last time with myself and Baswati Ji. We have a young Aditi who's joining us from Jaipur, and you heard her comments. And uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Hari here with us, and you heard his comments too. Uh, Dr. Hari also coordinates the working of uh, four of the NSS hospitals. Um, now, uh, Dr. Hari, please, for people in the for the four of us here, please uh, give us what the acronym NSS stands for, because Baswati Ji might not know it. The NSS stands for Nair Service Society, yes. which is a hundred year old community based non governmental organization of mm -hmm. social and cultural nature mm -hmm. in Kerala. Mm -hmm. 
They run 120 schools, uh, 20 arts and science colleges, one engineering college, one homeopathic medical college, mm -hmm. and uh, also recently one Ayurvedic college in the corporate sector. And I think six modern medical hospitals and four Ayurvedic hospitals. Thank you so much. You see, it's a huge organization. Uh, and these are, uh, it's, it seems uh, unfortunate that um, people don't know about the uh, Nair Service Society. There is even a nice wiki article on the NSS, uh, Nair Service Society. Now, how can, how can you engage with them to bring them closer to our valley activities? Is there something you can do for us? We have to see, uh, Dr. Madan. Uh, I'm, 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 I don't have a, a mission. No, that I'm right just now. saying, I just want to leave that question with you. I wasn't expecting an answer, but just leave a question, leave the talk with you, because this, the work that you're doing in the community is amazing. Uh, uh, there is another group, the uh, Sri Narayana group. Uh, yep, yep. group. I, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, the SNDP or Sri SNDP. Narayana Dharma Paripalana Yogam. Uh, it is uh, an equally old, NSS is 100 years plus old. SNDP is even older than that. That, is, uh, that was uh, uh, also of the same objective. I think they all have been uh, uh, started in Kerala uh, after the Renaissance when education and healthcare were uh, the most important uh, focus and the social changes were happening in Kerala and uh, the post Renaissance uh, Kerala organizations, SNDP as well. They're also running schools, colleges and exactly. hospitals in a similar scale. Yeah. I think it, it is very close to uh, the entire philosophy of the Irish Valley some of these activities of the big old organizations in terms of looking at uh, community, community life and living in a different way. You know? And uh, I think this is very important. So thank you so much for uh, sharing this. Uh, the reason why I also raised this is because Basvatiji has been engaged very closely with developing a program of introducing Ayush systems into something called the EC, ECHS. Uh, you are aware of that, the ECHS, Harry? Uh, employment yeah. contributory. Yeah. So yeah. they have also a, a network across India on healthcare for post, for ex-servicemen. Uh, exactly. And, and ECHS is a big network. So Baswatiji has been involved with a gentleman named Colonel Manik Anand, and uh, I think the first um, introduction happened in some of the polyclinics in Trivandrum. So uh, the interaction began in January 2019, and uh, the first uh, activity in ECHS polyclinics, I think they have about 500 polyclinics across India, and the first interaction on Irish systems in these polyclinics took place in Trivandrum. In April. In Trivandrum and uh, neighborhood of Trivandrum. So uh, we, we would love to see, maybe we will have an event where we bring together these groups into the Irish Valley for discussion. So thank you so much for uh, highlighting these things. And uh, it just alerts me that it would be useful to open a dialogue with these organizations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Baswatiji, I leave this with you uh, before we wind down. Aditi, I'm so happy that you have stayed with us. Uh, Ravi, uh, sorry, uh, I also very much want um, to see, uh, Pramishri, how we can engage a little more uh, in terms of uh, hosting when the COVID thing subsides, how we can start to host events across Kerala in the, yes, in, in the Ravi's uh, environment. So, Madan, 
you say I leave it with you and then you continue on and you don't let here me, are, here me speak. Um, so I don't know if Dr. Uh, Mr. Pramesh had a chance to speak and if you wanted to say something. So. Pramesh, are you there? Yes, Pramesh. Pramesh, hello. No. Pramish, can you hear us? Audio issues, I think. Pramish is. Um, it's a point. Vaspati Ji, all yours. Now, this is the reason why I raised this. I leave it as an issue for Aditi and for Dr. Hari to think about. It's very unusual that you get a practicing clinician who's also a medical anthropologist. And the question that I always have is that people set these standards and they say, these standards need to be followed. And this is the way it is. Hello. change things and that in fact right now it's a time of disruption and disruption is probably one of the best things that we can do to break down walls that just have not been working for us because the people that put them up had a different level of knowledge 50 years ago they had different biases and the world was in a different place the question that i always come to in health anthropology sociology public health and disease care is what about the issue of competence? It's very easy for people who get into positions based on nepotism, they get their salary, they don't have to worry. But what about the people that work in actual positions where competence is very important? I can name many uh, positions. I think Aditi and Dr. Hari have highlighted the problems that happen in their education, which is why they had such great suggestions, but all of them at their STEM are pointing to lack of competence, either in the lab staff or in the college uh, setup or in the actual teacher's competence or in the clinicians. How do we measure competence? And that is going to be a topic that I really want to take up on hard talk. I just cannot figure out how to do it in 60 minutes though. So I wonder, putting it out there, if either of the clinicians, Aditi, Dr. Hari, maybe any of the others who are actually um, practicing, how do you build a curriculum around competence and not on attendance or credits that are based on papers and exams and syllabus that's just mugging up facts, as Aditi had said. Do either of you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, competence, uh, as much as I understand, uh, competence, how could it be scaled? How could it be uh, calibrated is a big question. Normally, people say competence uh, according to uh, one's professional success. So if someone is uh, professionally very successful, there are many uh, patients for someone. Uh, you know, if he's a practitioner, then we say he's competent. Uh, but uh, sometimes we may also have questions about professional competence of a very popular doctor. Uh, sometimes uh, not, but that, that's also there. You know, you have a question of competence, uh, not easy to answer. Regarding uh, competence in teaching and learning, I would, I would rather say uh, examinations based on clinical questions and clinical evaluations, even research papers published or actual research done, such introductions in the curriculum and improvements may improve competence of students as well as teachers. So I think the University Grants Commission have a, a, a methodology of improving competence. The National Accreditation Councils visit. My, my wife being an academician, I know the National Academic uh, National Accreditation Council visits and how important these NAC visits are for every teaching college in India. So 
similarly, the teaching institutions should prove their competence uh, through such uh, visits, which are seriously done, reviews seriously done, etc. So, so I think I'm sorry, and my 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 baby is making some noise. So, so I think that is that is a very important uh, way in which competence could be ensured. Thank you. Mm, that's a, an interesting perspective that you have. Uh, before I go forward, Aditi, did you want to add anything? Are you there? Aditi. 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 No, I, I think you, I think uh, I do have, I just want to say that is uh, when we go into these quality uh, domains, qualitative domains. How do you quantify um, these things? And I, I, I hope I've understood your question correctly. Uh, uh, that's what you about competence and how to assess and quantify and grade competence. Um, well, I actually have to say that there's been a lot of work done on this, a lot, not only in the modern medical arena, um, but in the Ayurvedic arena in the US. And so my work with the, the council. Way, um, the, uh, the way the ancient, the old ancient people did this was largely through apprenticeship, you know, that, um, that uh, the Harry mentioned. So when you're apprenticed to someone over a reasonably long period of time, then the mentor finds ways to match the ability of the mentee to absorb information. So there's a constant dialogue and there's a constant observation feedback. And the second thing is that in those old systems, they encourage the study of these texts in that language. And that language has a special uh, energy to it, and that language has a special um, power that enhances certain faculties. And a lot of people might say, people who are not familiar with Sanskrit as a language would say this is all nonsense, but the fact is that it's the language that connects so directly with the physiology of the human body, the sound of the language and the way it is uttered and uh, pronounced connects directly with the physiology of the human body. And all of that has somehow been got rid of. Um, and we don't have that level of intensity that was there when you had that old system. And to me, when I hear the question you're asking, my mind is saying, is there a way to get around that system? Is there a way to get around you? Maybe Sanskrit provided that cushion and that way to enable that competence could be measured. So somebody who could read Sanskrit already had a certain kind of competence. And is that something that needs to come back? Um, it's just like saying, if you know how to play tennis well, then you can do everything well. What they're trying to say is that you have a certain kind of hand-eye coordination that comes with doing the sport. Basically. And when you know you, you, you have that hand-eye coordination, then there are many other things within you that get honed automatically. Uh, you might have less a chance of uh, obesity. You might have less chance of having certain kind of practices. You might uh, have a lesser chance of going down certain ways of thinking just because you have fine-tuned your hand-eye coordination. And maybe there was, a, there was a way in which these skills were interconnected in the old days, which we are losing out by putting people in a classroom, which is the point Aditi is making. You put people in a classroom and you then 
throw things at them and not let them be creative, then you lose certain skills and you don't grow certain things. Uh, I mentioned I was at an event yesterday hosted by Rashtram School of Public Leadership in Sonipat. And uh, this was a preparation for celebrating the um, 100 years of uh, Sri Aurobindo. Mm -hmm. All these points came up there. You know, we had people like uh, Rindranath Tagore who ran his own school because he felt that was the way to teach people. And the one example that was given by one of the panelists yesterday was that we need a complete rethink in how we educate students. For instance, you must take a given object, and the example that was given yesterday was a mango tree. And that is what you're going to teach about. You're going to teach, you're going to use the mango tree as the focus for touching aspects of chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, human physiology, everything centering around the mango tree. And maybe that is the kind of um, way you can evolve teaching. Aditi touched on it very briefly by saying, if you take, uh, if you start early on a certain kind of clinical training and you say, this is our focus, we're going to start with this person who has a certain problem and then the teacher takes you through every detail about that person uh, and he or she shows you how to understand and how to engage with an individual and show everything else based on that individual. We might arrive at a different style, which is just like the hand-eye coordination based competence that enables you to engage in other areas. Uh, Hand-eye coordination in tennis means you learn to play, you learn to engage with people on a tennis court, or you learn to share your ideas in a different way, et cetera, et cetera. So this is... Uh, I think that's one way of um, looking at it, and I think it's uh, one level of the answer. Um, I want to propose that there's actually a need for us to do homework. Mm -hmm. So, Madan, you and I have talked about what goes on when we finish our master's and move up to the PhD level, how we have our orals and our comps. So comps are comprehensive exams. They'll give you the entire field and say one of these three topics will be what you have to present on and we will um, see you on Wednesday. And then you have that number of days until Wednesday to get those three topics ready and then you pick out of a hat, you pick one of the three topics and then you present on it. That requires not only competence on your part of knowing those three topics, but it requires that the uh, people that are sitting as judges or as um, examiners, they also know those three topics. And so these are eminent people. So I took my comps, my first PhD in pharmacology. I took them in uh, pharmacology. And I still remember to this day that I had to talk about icosanoids and I had to talk about calcium channel blockers. And the third was um, something they didn't pick. It was um, the neuromuscular synapse of the heart because we had some very, very illustrious scientists in pharmacology at Columbia. Fine. Once you pass those exams and you've shown that you can master how to find the literature, where to find the literature, you read the literature, you ask questions about why they use the methodology they did, and then you know the people that wrote the papers, then and only then are you graduated to the level where you can start working on a thesis. And the fact that that is required is... Um, I don't see that in PhD students today. I don't see that they actually master the literature for which they are supposed to be at the highest degree of understanding of their subject. I certainly don't see it at the MD Ayurveda level, and I don't see it when they finish their MD Ayurveda. They don't know how to search for um, things on, on the internet. They might put it into Google, maybe, and find something, but they say, ma'am, there's nothing there. Mm. Oh, Okay, well, if you don't spell the word properly, if you don't understand a search strategy, they don't know what a search strategy is. They don't know what survey instruments are. They don't know the technical terminology of how to even search for papers. 
And then you've got these professors who are their professors in those MD uh, courses who never made them teach because they themselves don't know how to Did you hear me or did I get cut off? Uh, no, we've heard you. We heard you. Now, question is, you are now, can you see if your camera or option is working now? Yes, I can. Aditi, can you hear me? Can you me? see me? Yeah. Oh, yes, well, I can. So, you know, so uh, I've spent a lot of time looking into not only competence, because I am fascinated with how we're going to create this model around the world, not just in America and in Europe, and it would be wonderful if right. since I've done so much homework. I worked for a man named Ramesh Bangal who runs Kerala Ayurveda Private Limited, and uh, I was hired to do a white paper on the status of education. And I've met people that actually read that paper. It's a 12-page paper on how to educate people who are not BAMS students um, about Ayurveda course was that Dr. Hari talked about that he did um, in the uh, uh, Rangula village that he was um, teaching in. So one is how do you teach it? One is how do you evaluate it? And what are the best models? And I have worked around the was an American education college uh, fellowship recipient, which is a very prestigious fellowship where people learn what the best education models are around the world. They get paid to travel to 15 different education models around the world and see how that relates to their particular subject. So my sister and brother-in-law are astrophysicists, so that was their subject. And of course, I picked his brains on what was happening in medicine and public health. And I am fascinated with the models that are out there that are actually very good models, but that are not Um, competence and evolution of competence, Dr. Hardy was talking about, and some of the things that um, Aditi was talking about. And I will say that some of the best models that are out there have been done, and we are just not looking at them. So the Coimbatore experiment that was done by my guru, Krishna Kumarji, the other of my teachers, um, the system that is there for apprenticeship that is done at Odar Medical College in Bombay, the SDM Medical College, which has a huge clinical exposure that they give to their students so that they don't walk out not have an allopathic uh, Ayurvedic um, interface. There are a lot of different experiments that different principals and different teachers have tried. And I'm just wondering why there is not a paper or some kind, maybe we have to write the paper, um, but why there's not something like that written? Because it's sitting in the heads of all Accreditation Sorry. council who went around. Maybe the and we need to put those together. Yeah, maybe the time is right to draw those things together. And yeah, and I don't think all. it should be one person. I think it should be a team of us. And we've waited to be appointed to committees. We're not going to be because they don't. Hello. People. And the metrics of who is successful gets to decide who's on the committee. So maybe what we need to do is just write the papers and put that information there for the sake of our future generation so that they can see some of these really fantastic best case scenarios that maybe they don't even know exist. As, as it is, as you, did you hear all that and do you have something to add? Sir, actually, due to network issues, uh, I'm some part my uh, topics. And what we should do, we are running. Uh, we've spent quite some time here. Now, Dr. Hari has shared his email. I've sent a message to Dr. Hari, and uh, Dr. Hari, yes, I've sent you. I've sent you a brief message. So we look forward to continuing by email. Aditi is also copied on that message. Baswati ji is also copied on that message. And Pramish uh, uh, ji. Pramish, hello. 
Well, I just want to thank both of you who uh, contributed actively and to Dr. Pramish and to uh, Dr. Sudhir, if he's still there. I don't know who all the people are that are still, oh, okay, I can see the attendees now. So I would love to um, stay with you. I hope that you will come to the hard talk as well as the other starting um, a series of programs that are on different theme subjects. So it would be great to continue getting your input. So um, I want to say thanks to Aditi because I know you've had network issues and you've hung in there. But I also want to say thank you to Dr. Hari because I do remember we had a little exchange on. I think that was the same Dr. Hari that we're speaking to now. So thank you.